conference and produced by the Sound of Knowledge Incorporated. All right, we're just about ready to start. All right, welcome to the Secure Hardware Design presentation. My name is Kingpin. To my left is Brian Oblivion. Uh, we are from the At Stake Research and Development Group, which was formerly Loft Heavy Industries. Um, some of our expertise involves uh, portable electronic and, uh, and uh, microprocessor system design, reverse engineering of hardware-based security products, uh, wireless technologies, and uh, electrical engineering in general. What we want to do today uh, is to understand, as designers, how to properly design and implement security into your product. Uh, what we're going to do is, first we need to lay down the foundations of designs involving security to get the process in place, um, make sure we have solid documentation. Um, after that, we need to understand some of the high-level attack methods that attackers will use uh, to target your product. Uh, so we'll run through uh, some high-level attack scenarios. Finally, we'll discuss actual design recommendations and methods of secure hardware design. So these would be actual implementations and, and uh, recommendations that, that we've learned over time. Um, what we're going to do is we have a lot of slides and we're going to try to run through fairly quickly and those who are interested can come to the overflow session which I believe is at uh, 12 or 1.30 after lunch. So why secure hardware? This is a question uh, that's that's becoming very common. It's similar to asking, why have a secure network? Um, well, embedded systems are everywhere now. Every, um, internet appliances, uh, any device with networking capabilities, they're being implemented everywhere. Uh, in most cases, if you compromise the system, you can access any kind of cryptographic secrets, private data, um, possibly launch further attacks from that device. So we have um, routers, switches, crypto accelerators, all of these things that, that are hardware devices that are now being targeted for attack. Um, detailed analysis and reverse engineering techniques are available to everybody. Um, there's technical white papers, uh, technical journals that document uh, various attacks on hardware products. Um, everybody can read these, so as a designer you need to uh, be aware of these and lock down your system properly. Yeah, and uh, one thing that Bruce alluded to was um, uh, that Secure hardware necessarily won't fix the problems, and what we're trying to present here are ways to alleviate risk out of the hands of application developers and to move the stuff down into a lower level so that um, application programmers don't necessarily have to twiddle with the algorithms necessarily. And uh, the best security methods are... Um, <laughs> this one up a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Best, best, best security methods are when they're um, undetectable and unavoidable. Um, that, that way there's less programming mistakes and uh, um, application uh, software writers can focus on their, their task which is to, to come up with the next whiz bang thing and uh, the security manager on the project, if there even is one, can focus on um, the lower level hardware making sure that certain mechanisms are there and uh, um, s sometimes the security mechanisms can even keep the application programmers in check by uh, having certain bounds on memory and and whatnot, and we'll get into that later. Yeah, so as designers, we're presented with this challenge of making security uh, part of the system and make it our burden as designers, um, not the burden of the users. Uh, because as, as Brian mentioned, basically, if security features are going to slow productivity or make it difficult to access certain things, um, people will find a way to circumvent that, including legitimate users. So having security in that point uh, just won't work. So it's best when it's indetectable and unavoidable. And also, the means exist. Um, there's, there's a cryptographic system on a chip. There's devices available that are now low cost that you can implement into your system um, to help make them secure. So 
So as I mentioned, at, at first, before you even start your design, you need a solid development process. Um, this involves a number of things. You, you will need to have a, um, design requirements agreed upon. This would be everything from uh, how the device will operate to some of the circuitry you're planning on using. Uh, many times as the product is being developed, a change will be made either to the circuitry or documentation or firmware. Um, without re-evaluating re the security implica implications sorry, of that change, um, which could lead to a number of problems down the road if you overlook those changes. So you need to have these design requirements solid, and if there is a change, you need to uh, verify that the security still works. All right, and then we, um, we, outline, we outline a bunch of, uh, um, you, know, you really should identify the risks of the entire life cycle not just how to protect certain secrets or you know, trying to secure a communications management channel. Um, you should really uh, document everything you do so if, uh, as, as your product's moving from prototype to prototype, fixes that you implement uh, sometimes break other things. And um, by having good revision software control, or software revision control and uh, verbose design documentation, you can sometimes backtrack and figure out you know, why did this break and you can take steps to remediate it. Um, the uh, final thing, well, the two final things is mainly once you're done with your prototypes, you're moving to manufacturing. A lot of times people just, you know, hand the design off to manufacturing and say, produce many times and, uh, and, and distribute. Um, you really should look at uh, um, the personnel. You know, you're basically trusting these people to initialize, especially in the case of cryptographic hardware, you know, where you initialize it and then you ship it out and hopefully you have a mechanism in there to detect whether it's been tampered with in transit. Um, uh, if, if you have some type of um, uh, code signing stuff and somebody replaces the public key in the device itself with something else, um, then that person has the ability to become the root signer for any applications you download into the device, uh, which would be very bad. Um, you can also, uh, you, you, should, you should then look at end of life recommendations. You know, many times devices will uh, have keys in them. Uh, military is very uh, uh, used to this and they'll, basically shred any type of classified module at the uh, end of use. Um, and, and as uh, commercial designers, we should really look into that as well. Yeah, along with that, as far as identifying the risks, um, there's always this risk management. I know Bruce and I have talked about this a little bit. Um, as designers, we need to, first of all, define the enemy and know what we're protecting against. Um, this is going to vary depending on how your product is being used. Um, we also need to determine what an acceptable level of security is, uh, and also determine what the cost and benefit trade-off of that security will be. So, you know, we, we don't want to spend X amount of dollars on a product if, or on security if the product isn't really worth that. So you just need to identify which risks you have. Um, identify single points of failure. You need to understand what they are and how do you handle. We talk about this in our system level um, recommendations a little later on. Uh, these points of failure are also not only related to the hardware and software, but they're also related to uh, development personnel, engineers, uh, and your manufacturing process. Actually, there was one, sorry, there was one other thing on there that I, that I skipped. The third party design review is extremely important. This, this will bring a, a fresh set of eyes on your design. Um, so as you go through your milestones in your product and you know, on a monthly basis or a weekly basis, however often you review your product, um, having someone else in there as a third party will help you uh, possibly detect design faults um, and maybe security problems or problems that could lead to uh, security vulnerabilities later on. So as far as understanding what kinds of attackers will be attacking your product, um, they vary greatly. As you can see, this slide came from uh, the cryptography research guys. Um, our recommendations in this talk will basically, we will, we will alleviate the problems of the teenager and the academic columns, uh, but we will also be able to um, make it difficult for the organized crime and the government columns, the people that have a lot of money and a lot of time um, and want to break your product. Uh, we'll be able to, to uh, prevent, at least help prevent uh, some of those attacks as well. So there are four ways that an attacker can gain access to your product, and this is important to understand in order to know what types of security features you need to implement. Um, the first one is purchase. This would be where an attacker would go uh, to the store, 
um, purchase your product, bring it back to their lab, and work on it without um, any fear of being caught, basically. Um, there'll be physical tampered countermeasures in place that we also, we discuss some of these later, that will prevent disclosure of the potential of the system. Um, but if those are bypassed, then you basically would have fr free reign, the attacker would have free reign. Um, by purchasing the product, you'll be able to determine how the whole product works. Um, but it can be monetarily prohibitive. It might be expensive. You're not, an attacker might not spend $20,000 to buy a router um, to look at it for one security problem. So there's a, a downside to purchasing. Uh, evaluation is where an attacker would rent the product from a vendor or a distributor, um, often on a monthly basis. This would be to evaluate the product in normal use and also to, to uh, try to take apart the product. Most of these attacks are treated as a black box. Um, the attacker will be cautious to really tamper with it and open it up because there might be tamper seals and things that would be evident um, that the device was tampered with, which would probably void warranty and uh, you'd end up paying a large amount of money to whoever you rented the product from. Yeah, the, the other thing about the um, purchasing evaluation, uh, a lot of times an attacker will take one of those systems and sacrifice it just to figure out how the internal uh, tamper-proofing mechanisms work. And they can then use those techniques to then go after a system that may be live somewhere. Um, and they'll know how to defeat certain tamper mechanisms, get around it, pull the, uh, you know, it's kind of like a black, black bag type run into an ISP uh, where you'll, you'll pop the lid off, extract the secrets out of the live system, and then uh, seal it back up, hopefully without uh, leaving any tamper evident uh, uh, marks behind. Right, and that goes right with this, with the active and in service um, types of attacks where most of the attacks are possible. Um, you, the device would be in actual service and in actual operation, um, but an attacker would still have physical access to it, so if, if they uh, got into your knock or into wherever your machines are running. Um, this obviously is a very high risk uh, scenario because you can get caught red-handed um, sitting there tampering with someone's router or crypto accelerator, uh, which would be bad. Um, remote access is the final one. This is where an attacker doesn't even require physical access to your product. Um, so you might not need to have any kind of physical tamper proofing um, in place. This would be uh, standard network attacks, um, attacks through dial ups and things like that. Okay, I'm going to uh, quickly walk through a bunch of the different types of attacks that an attacker will um, uh, walk through. Usually, the attacker will uh, hit, hit the system, hit it with uh, system level attacks where they, they don't have very much information out of the box. This might just be, you know, after a, uh, uh, an attacker does a network scan somewhere and they just are trying to figure out what the OS is and they'll like hit it with a port scanner, try to figure out, um, you know, what, what services it's running. Uh, all those types of attacks can be performed remotely. Um, another type of system attack is before you actually get the screwdriver out and pop, try to pop the lid off, um, you can see if there's uh, any other, if like, there's a floppy disk there, you can try to boot off of it. And uh, then if, if the system's um, complicated enough, there'll be uh, other file systems that you could mount subsequently and then try to extract applications and data off of it. Okay, so if you don't get anywhere and um, you're determined to get the box, uh, if, if you're determined to get the secrets in the box, uh, you probably go out and either purchase it or um, uh, try to get one under evaluation and uh, get the screwdriver out. If, it's, if there's tamper bits on it, you know, I have to get the proper bit and start popping it open. Also, um, if it's heavily, if it has a lot of heavily uh, tamper-proofing mechanisms on the system, um, you may have to use less invasive attacks such as uh, thermal probing or thermal imaging and um, x-ray. And uh, if there's some vents in it, you could also snake in a fiber optic camera possibly to find uh, micro switches and other types of devices to, um, uh, to properly lock down so when you pop the case off, it doesn't zeroize itself. Um, after you actually get the, oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah, so the cir circuit level stuff, uh, there's, there's a number of attacks here. Um, gaining access to the circuitry uh, will let you uncover various design issues and design flaws that you could possibly, or that an attacker would possibly um, exploit. Uh, you, the attacker could um, basically create a schematic by looking at the PC board, which is essentially a roadmap um, of the electrical uh, circuitry. So PC board design and parts placement is, is uh, would be recreating the schematic to learn how the system works. 
component substitution. This would be where an attacker would uh, replace a processor with um, their own firmware or possibly reprogramming an FPGA to do certain things. Um, any kind of low-level component substitution um, to make the device do something that it wasn't intended to do. Active bus and device probing would uh, consist of looking at the various I.O. lines, the address and data lines and other control lines from processors, um, from coprocessors to uh, possibly determine firmware and how the system operates. Um, the next two, fault induction attacks and timing attacks have been talked about a lot with a lot of white papers recently. There's some references at the end of uh, this presentation in the notes. Um, one, these would be determined on a circuit level, uh, but they could be applied um, to a system level, a non-invasive attack, once the attacker can determine that they can be done. And the final one is an integrated circuit die analysis. This is also uh, a, a, a hot topic. Um, this would involve uh, delitting a device, possibly looking at the uh, ROM layout or how the fuses are burned on the ROM or, or uh, possibly in an, in an FPGA. So firmware attacks are, are the lowest level of, of attacks. Um, firmware, as most of you know, contain the program code that would control the embedded system. Um, analyzing the firmware obviously gives you a low level understanding of the product. Um, and it will also allow an attacker to make software changes, possibly to bypass failure detection uh, by removing fault checks or maybe authentication measures. Um, so along with having the, cir the circuit schematic and the firmware together, uh, you basically have the entire, can understand how the entire system works. Yeah, and then there's one more, th there's, there's one more attack um, that kind of fits under the system level and that is uh, a lot of uh, vendors out there, like printers specifically, and a lot of uh, PC makers have um, their, their BIOS images right up on their website, so you can just go out and download strings for uh, embedded backdoor passwords, or um, uh, just, just you know, oh, there's a lot of decompilers out there now that uh, will, will, will definitely give you the, the generic flow of the uh, system, and it'll hints on uh, where you could possibly tweak it, and then um, perhaps download into uh, uh, target systems to to uh, bypass those types of mechanisms that uh, KP just mentioned. Um, what, what needs to pr be protected? Well, basically everything we just talked about that uh, can be attacked, um, sp most specifically are the firmware binaries. Um, many times it's a very low cost attack where you can just go out and uh, view the stuff that's sitting out on open, open uh, websites, uh, usually support websites. Um, next is the uh, boot sequence. Um, you definitely don't want to have the ability for applications, uh, applications code to step back and reprogram firmware. Uh, that's, that's a bad thing. Um, cryptographic functionality, if it's in the device, which it should be, uh, you don't want people messing around with those and weakening the algorithms. Um, sometimes the algorithms can be weakened and r remain undetectable. Um, or you could have them uh, leak out secrets. And uh, the configuration and management channels need, need to be protected because if if, if you don't protect the management channels, then the device can always be configured in an in unsecure manner. Um, so now we're going to talk about some of the uh, thanks, some of the um, countermeasures to the attacks we just discussed. Uh, first thing I'd like to stress is the uh, need for a trusted base, which really comes from the old uh, DoD trusted systems uh, e evaluation criteria, which is now. Uh, morphed into IT sec uh, common criteria. Um, example of a uh, trusted base is um, uh, a lot of people are calling them security processors. Uh, I like to refer to them as a cryptographic system on a chip. Um, in the old days, uh, in the 60s, 70s, a lot of people were embedding um, security uh, reinforcement hardware as a module, and these things cost like 10, 20, 30 grand at times. And uh, through the advances in technology of squeezing more and more devices onto one chip, um, you get basically the same functionality in a uh, $20 or $40 part that you can embed onto a router, firewall, or any other type of specific uh, NIC, or drop it right on the motherboard. Um, with, with this, you don't need an expensive tamper envelope around the entire box. You have it somewhat restricted to the die itself, and that really does take the attacks out of the hands of most attackers. But as you can see from uh, Marcus Kuhn's paper on um, uh, the state of uh, smart card security, he successfully, you know, using uh, fuming nitric acid and stuff, 
removed all the protective epoxy and could actually do a dialysis attack. Uh, but I would have to say that that is a um, uh, tamper evident attack. Uh, the uh, the firmware can also be protected inside the trusted base. And you also have mechanisms that can um, verify the integrity of, uh, of software that isn't necessarily inside of the trusted base. Um, so some examples of uh, the uh, single IC uh, uh, devices are the IRE SafeNet DSP chip, the uh, PCC ISIS, uh, and the security coprocessors. There's the, uh, which I really like, the IBM 4758. These guys did an excellent job, and they really know the field well. And uh, Crystalis ITS just came out with the um, uh, Luna 340. And uh, I haven't gotten any information on that yet, but I'm trying to get some documentation from them. Um, so it, one of the things that, that runs inside of the trusted base is a security kernel. And what that kernel does is it uh, enforces the security policy for the system, and it also has the ability to decouple uh, the keys from, from any uh, OS calls or application level calls. Um, instead of having the application software generate the key itself, you can just ask the security kernel to go perform a operation, an encryption operation, without ever knowing what the key is. Just say you use key and register uh, uh, one or, or A or B, and then uh, encrypt it and just give me the result. I don't need to know the actual contents of the key. I just need to know whose key it is. Um, a good example of this is Cryplib, and uh, there's a it's written by uh, Peter Gutman out in the uh, University of Auckland. It's a, I, I recommend it. Um, un unfortunately, I don't have any way to like really, you know, without poking Joe in the eye, uh, walk through this diagram, but I'd be glad to walk through it in the uh, extended uh, deeper knowledge session. But b basically, the, the, the CSOC there um, will hold the microprocessor in, in, in reset until it can verify its firmware. And once it's verified, it'll let the microprocessor um, out of reset and then to boot off of its firmware. Uh, it, it also shows by that memory mapped bus to, um, uh, you know, it, it'll control the communications interface. There'll be two buffers, an encrypt and decrypt buffer. And the CSOC will be told to do an operation on one buffer and then tell the NIC interface to pull it out of the other buffer. But I can go on that in greater detail in the other room. Uh, failure modes. Determining, um, uh, one, one of the things that a uh, proper design practice calls for is a security fault analysis. And what that is, is a uh, set of procedures and tests that you perform on your product to determine how it responds or reacts due to certain environmental or um, induced attacks, uh, such as um, uh, excessive heat, cold, um, if a chip fails, if memory fails. Um, will, will your system fail open, fail closed? Will it fail in a way that the, uh, um, uh, the cipher text is, is mangled somewhat? There were some papers released about uh, um, vulnerabilities and key leaking through uh, Chinese remainder theorems based on hardware failures. Um, you really need to determine what the response uh, merits depending on the failure detected. Um, it may require that the system's halted and uh, um, to uh, you know, send in a some type of message to the um, crypto officer or whoever manages the device to come you know, fix me. Uh, you may want to set a flag and continue if it's not a, uh, a catastrophic failure. Or um, if, if, if you set up your detection circuitry properly, you can possibly determine an attack over time. And if the temperature drops, drops too fast, that may be an indication of a, uh, a tamper event. And you may want to zeroize certain secrets out of memory. Okay, um, management interfaces, as I mentioned before, uh, if, if you don't secure these things, you know, what, what good is the rest of it, really? Um, don't, don't include service backdoors. Uh, I uh, did some work on a uh, uh, SSL accelerator, and lo and behold, they had backdoors embedded in it, and they also had a web-based uh, management interface, and that web-based management interface was not protected, even though the device was used for accelerating SSL uh, traffic. All right, so now we have uh, some firmware um, recommendations, which is basically uh, designing some of the low-level boot code, system initial initialization issues, um, and also dealing with, with uh, writing firmware in general. Can you hear? Yeah. 
All right, secure programming practice. Um, this is basically just using common sense guidelines when you're writing your software. Um, this would consist of removing symbols, debug symbols from your code, uh, using compiler optimizations, which might help. Uh, it will not only speed up the code possibly, but also um, use some of its internal uh, macros and things to, to help obfuscate the code. It might make it a little harder to reverse engineer. Um, one thing that we've seen is to have two or three versions of the firmware. This would have uh, a development version, so the version of the firmware as you're developing your product, um, possibly an engineering version that might have uh, less of the debug information kind of moving towards a production, and then th the production version, which won't have any of these symbols, uh, no debug information, things that aren't needed in the actual product. Uh, we've seen a lot of companies that will ship their firmware with all of this information internal to it, and as you're reverse engineering the device or you, you uh, disassemble the code, you end up with a lot of useful information. Um, also, a, as far as removing the, uh, the debug information, it's kind of hard to see, but on a lot of uh, development environments and compilers, there's a button. All you do is click on that button, so just do it. It's easy. Um, it will, it will re remove a bunch of opportunities to attackers. Buffer overflows, Bruce Schneier just talked about a little bit. Um, they're highly publicized, um, attempted often, and they're also attempted on hardware products, not only uh, software, as you've seen a lot of uh, problems with Microsoft in particular. Um, th this also highlights the point of having source code reviews. Um, I'd mentioned having third, third party design reviews for the entire product, but also having people look over your code, make sure you don't have buffer overflows in there, make sure you don't have any blatant um, problems. This helps a lot, especially if you're staring at your code for 15 hours a day for three weeks or something. Um, you start to miss a lot of things. So having fresh set of eyes is important. And one thing about third-party reviews, um, a lot of people who are designing secure hardware, uh, specifically cryptographic modules, will will generally think that uh, uh, the uh, uh, what's it called? I can't believe it. Uh, FIPS 140 dash. Uh, one, I think. It's got four different levels of um, certification. A lot of people think that's a third party review. It's really not. They're, they're, they, they come in before you sell the, you know, you're trying to get your, your device uh, certified basically to operate at a certain security level. And a lot of times um, people mistake that as a third party review. They'll just look at your product after it's already gone through all its design cycles and just um, either give you a pass or fail. And sometimes they'll give you uh, some some comments on it, but generally I don't, I don't think it's too helpful. Um, the next slide here is about the boot sequence. Unfortunately, this, is, this doesn't even look good on the uh, slides that were printed out, so it's going to be kind of hard to um, uh, go through. But uh, the top part is a normal systems boot sequence, and the bottom one here is the got, got the trusted base module, the uh, C cryptographic system on a chip, and that dashed line um, shows the normal uh, uh, boot and verify type steps that a system will perform when, <clears throat> when booting. Uh, usually what it'll do is it'll, it'll verify the boot ROM uh, firmware itself inside of the CSOC, and then if, if that's okay, it'll, it'll proceed to the next thing, and that, it'll first go out and verify like firmware stored on an uh, uh, off-chip device. Um, if that's okay, it'll go out and start verifying kernels, applications, and whatnot. But you can always, you can always like, Roll back your train of trust back to that, uh, back to the code that's inside the CSOC that can't be necessarily tampered with. Runtime diagnostics. Um, oh, let me just run through this. Um, it's it's really good to uh, perform periodic low-level checks on the hardware. Um, the best uh, example of this is um, whenever you do a key generation. Uh, routine, you should really make sure that the numbers you're getting are random from the random bit generator. If you're getting all ones or all zeros due to some other attack, that's that's a bad thing, or the device may have just failed. Um, you can normally do, I think for FIPS, there's a, uh, like three or four tests you're supposed to perform um, before accepting a random number to uh, uh, generate a key with. Um, so yeah, as far as... Uh, these runtime diagnostics are, are these periodic low-level checks. Um, they can be done with the key generation, but it's also um, just to perform checksums on memory, uh, make sure the firmware, the ROM, and the RAM uh, is consistent and no data has been changed. You get what you expect. 
Um, a lot of this could be done in hardware, uh, but you can also do some of this in firmware, which is why we, we mention it in this section. All right, uh, secret management, it's uh, pretty much a known brainer. Never leak um, unencrypted secrets out. Uh, a lot of um, business applications require um, the escrowing of keys for like large uh, uh, backups and stuff. You don't want to, you know, if, if your module is tampered with or just you know, it burns in the building, you don't want to lose vast stores and stores of um, unencrypted data. But you really need to know that escrow mechanisms are a security risk. And if required, you know, you're, uh, uh, the key generation and escrow should be done in the presence of, human, in, uh, presence of humans. Um, once you get the uh, key encryption key out, you should really like you know do <laughs> to do your do your best at protecting that thing. And um, uh, if, if you if you if you escrow one key encryption key, then all the other ones can be encrypted with that key, and you only need to like uh, protect that one key in a safe you know in a bottom of a salt mine with armed guards. Uh, cryptographic functions. Um, again, we, I tried to stress the importance of having your uh, functions n um, not being able to have them uh, uh, twiddled with. And uh, a lot of people have been moving them into accelerator chips, uh, which are ASICs. Usually they're difficult to m modify. That's good if you're an attacker. That's, uh, I'm sorry, that's, that's not good if you're an attacker, and it's also not good uh, if you're a developer, because if uh, the standards change as they are right now, moving away from DES into AES. There's going to be a lot of um, obsolete hardware devices out there. Um, what you're seeing a lot now is a lot of um, uh, CSOC and FPGA-based uh, cryptographic um, uh, implementations of algorithms. And what that allows you to do is to uh, update the devices as needed. Um, it also enables uh, certain companies to skirt around export controls. Programmability. Oh, this is uh, touching upon the um, uh, firmware being distributed on uh, uh, support websites. Um, it would be nice if you could encrypt it, but if somebody goes out and purchases the device, they're obviously going to be able to extract it with a standard um, uh, prom programmer or reader of some sort, um, still weighing the benefits of encrypting it uh, over uh, just code signing. Um, if, if you sign your code and you have your um, public key or verify key embedded in the CSOC, you'll at least be able to verify its integrity. So if somebody else d d uh, changes your, your firmware in some way, they won't be able to run it on your processor because it'll fail to check. All right. Circuit layout and design issues we touched uh, a little bit upon on some of the attacks. So here are some recommendations. Um, make your device uh, secure. Um, test points. Basically, you, you, when you're doing your PC board design, actually, before I even go through these, um, proper PC board design is really an art form. Uh, you should probably either outsource or work closely with a full-time board designer if there's one in your company. Um, they know the CAD software. They know the tricks of the trade. They know a, a lot of the physical uh, PC board issues, um, which could help keep keep your product uh, designed properly uh, from a board level. So you want to remove unnecessary test points. Um, a lot of times, if you have too many test points, uh, they'll allow unwanted noise and interference to pass through the board. Um, you'll see in these next few slides, I'm going to talk a lot about um, keeping the EMI and the, the noise interference down. Um, we'll explain why in a few slides. Um, so you want to keep your traces as short as possible for that, for that same reason as far as noise, but it also uh, might make it difficult for an attacker to access those lines. Um, you can also route the signal traces on internal layers of a multi-plane board, um, which is good for production but not good for development because then uh, the engineers won't be able to access those lines. Um, also with, with uh, vias, you can have buried vias, uh, which would also be um, in the inner planes of the board, uh, which again is good for the production but not good for development. Um, keeping the ground plane separate is also um, uh, helps with noise issues. And if you alternate the power and ground planes uh, as you go through your layers, it, it helps add a, a little level of tamper detection. If an attacker was trying to drill through your board to access some of the some of the lines in the multi uh, layers, um, they might drill through power and ground and possibly short those together. Parts placement goes. Uh, hand in hand with PC board design. 
you want to make sure that all of your critical components, all of your uh, memory devices, possibly cryptographic um, processors, are um, difficult to access. Uh, so if you had uh, possibly two boards in your design, you could place all of your um, critical components in between the two boards and have uh, maybe a, a tamper response or a tamper sense line somewhere in the connector. So if those two boards were taken apart, you could zeroize memory um, or do some kind of tamper response. Um, an example of the parts placement I, I uh, will actually touch on a, a little bit later too is there's two advisories that I recently released on USB hardware tokens, which if you're not uh, familiar with them, they're basically uh, little embedded systems that will store um, private data used for authentication and public key applications and things like that. Um, I looked at two devices and both of those devices had, they used um, an external serial double EEPROM, which are, are extremely common in the engineering industry. Uh, they're also extremely easy to read data out of. Um, and the reason these attacks were so easy is because these parts uh, were placed, they were easily, easily accessible on the PC board. So as I opened up the product, I could easily clamp on to the, uh, to the double EEPROM devices. I didn't have to, to deal with any kind of tampering or, or uh, obfuscated placement of, of the parts. Um, so also the proper power filtering um, and the noisy circuitry, that, that's also part of noise. Um, the reason you want to reduce the noise issues is because there are some attacks such as Tempest, which we'll, we'll touch on also later, that make use of the stray noise generated by the device. Uh, you could possibly recreate um, images from a monitor or uh, gain secrets or private data. So you want to keep the noise down also for FCC uh, regulations and if you're doing medical devices, FDA regulations, you need to keep the noise down. And that's just, that's just a good, uh, good design practice. So physical access to components, I just mentioned the USB devices. Um, if you look up on the screen, I know in the printout this is really hard to see, but this is uh, one of the USB hardware tokens we looked at. Um, what you can use is epoxy encapsulation to, to coat uh, the critical parts to make them harder to access. Um, unfortunately, if you don't implement that right, the coating does nothing. Um, on the, the device on my right, uh, there's a Cypress microprocessor, uh, which contains the firmware for this USB device. That was properly um, coded in epoxy. Uh, however, you could scrape that off or, or possibly use some kind of chemicals to remove that material. Um, but on the other side, there is a serial double EEPROM that's covered in epoxy. But then there's those eight silver pads, which is an expansion uh, memory footprint that isn't protected. Um, the nature of the serial double EEPROMs will allow me to attach probes to the eight unprotected uh, pads and read all of the memory of that protected device. So there's epoxy coating on there to protect, to prevent me from touching that device, but I can still read all of the data in it. And that led to um, compromise of the device and also led to a security advisory. So power supply and clock protection. This is uh, basically you want to take precautions to prevent um, intentional variation of power and clock, which a lot of attacks are based upon. Uh, you want to set an operating envelope um, by having minimum and maximum limits of your uh, VCC rail of what your clock should be. If there's any skew, you should be aware of that. Um, to protect against voltage variation, you can use a number of watchdog circuitry, um, ICs that are available from a number of companies and also standard DC to DC converters, regulators, things to keep your, uh, your voltages in line. Um, you can also monitor clock signals to detect variations. You could feed them back into your processor and have that as, as a check. So I.O. port properties. Um, this will be what do you do with all of your unused I.O. pins on your processor um, or your FPGA. Uh, you need to either disable all of the ones you're not using um, which will, which will prevent noise. Um, for example, on a Motorola 68000, there's a, a pin called clock out. And what this is, it's just used for testing of the internal 16 megahertz PLL, but that default is on. So if you don't turn those unused pins off, that thing's gonna just send out 16 megahertz signal on the board, and that's gonna generate noise, and that can lead to a lot of issues. Um, what you could do is, especially in FPGAs, uh, you could set some of your unused pins um, to detect probing, uh, which is what we call a digital, digital honeypot. Um, what you do is set uh, the pins as inputs, um, and if you detect a level change, possibly if someone pulls a pin to ground, 
uh, the FPGA will know that and you can assume the device is being probed and the circuitry can handle that um, properly. And that's, a, that's a low cost method that, that can be implemented. So when you're dealing with your programmable logic and memory, you want to make use of all of your on-chip security features. Um, there are security fuses and software protection bits and software protection um, strings that you can send to the device and make sure that it won't leak uh, the data. You won't, it, it, it will disallow somebody from reading um, the contents of the memory. Um, although there's sometimes ways to bypass that fuse, uh, for example, deleting and viewing the die, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which is popular in smart card attacks and, and mentioned in one of Marcus Kuhn's paper that I believe is a reference, um, you still need to take steps to protect uh, the firmware as well as you can. Uh, FPGA design, make sure you cover all of your conditions. You don't want to get into some undetermined state uh, and basically get, get your system thrown off into oblivion and not be able to recover from that. Um. And another thing that's nice on uh, more complex systems is to have a, uh, an advanced memory management unit. And what this will do is it'll sit and it'll monitor the address and data lines um, and also like the, uh, uh, at least on the 68340 series uh, Motorola processors, there's a um, uh, uh, four bits that determine if it's like, if, if the uh, system is running in supervisor, uh, user, or if it's a DMA operation. And a lot of times it's nice to monitor those um, those, those addresses and fetches in the different states because you can, uh, uh, A, you can keep the programmers in check to make sure they're not writing bad code and like using DMA to copy stuff out of your um, tamper uh, uh, non-volatile storage memory out to the SCSI port or to a, a network port. Um, you can also use it to protect firmware so that if you're in a certain mode, you can't update firmware on the board if it's in flash of some sort. Uh, other things you can do is if somebody's attacking a system, a lot of times what they do is they'll stick a uh, firmware image in there and just start probing different memory locations and start jetting them out any types of communications port. And you can set trip points in the address space. So if somebody tries to do a read out of a space that doesn't have a, chi uh, a device on it, um, it'll, it'll stop it right there. Some processes will actually, uh, once it gets to the end of a defined memory range, it'll wrap around to the beginning. And um, by using a... Uh, uh, like this, this, this memory management unit, you could blow into a FPGA or even a PAL. Um, you, can, you can trigger those types of attacks or probings. Um, <clears throat> ComSec, requ uh, ComSec requirements kind of touches upon um, uh, making sure that uh, encrypted stuff you know, stays encrypted and if you're gonna send red information, which is usually determined as uh, classified information in government circles, um, you, wanna, you wanna blacken it before it goes out of the box. That's, and also, um, a lot of times people will share buses on uh, uh, systems and just make sure you're turning things on and off properly. And uh, you, know, you, don't want, you don't want red data on a bus when it's being accessed by a, some type of black uh, routine. Um, uh, the enclosures, um, we're basically gonna talk about some tamper-proofing mechanisms here. Uh, don't go into great depth because this could be an entire talk all by itself. Um, there's, there's really four different classes of, uh, of tamper proofing and when I say tamper proofing it doesn't mean that you cannot tamper with it, it's just a, a classification of, of, of uh, anti-physical type attacks. Uh, usually there's resistance, evidence, detection, and uh, response. The first three are actual, actually the first two are actual mechanisms and the, the two final ones, detection and response, are more of a, a systematic um, handling of, of what the, the first two perform. Um, they're most effective when layered. So if you have uh, like a seal and then there's you know, a hardened steel case with maybe a medical lock and then inside of that you have micro switches and, and you can wrap the entire thing in epoxy, that's, that, that's effective layering. It just makes the uh, attacker's um, job a lot harder. Uh, tamper, some examples of tamper resistance is um, hardened steel cases, uh, locks, encapsulation, or uh, some types of uh, potting over material, uh, security screws like um, you see on the bottoms of set-top boxes, uh, tight airflow channels, um, 
there's there's a s certain angle of incidence that if when you're sending a fiber optic cable in, it'll bend far enough so that you can't get enough light back out to feed into a CCD camera. Uh, the uh, side of side effect of all tamper resistance is tamper evidence. Uh, usually, if someone takes the saws out to the hardened steel case, you can go look at it and notice that someone's been cutting through your equipment. <clears throat> Um, uh, tamper evidence is basically a major deterrent for minimal risk takers and that can uh, really help if you've got some type of equipment evaluation program and uh, you want to, you know, you want people to go out and evaluate your equipment. Uh, it's a good way to, to get this stuff in and people feel more comfortable with it. But it also uh, opens up a uh, very uh, lucrative avenue of attack for many minimal risk takers. And uh, simple seals and um, uh, tapes, maybe a special enclosure uh, finish or micro switches can, can help deter people from just popping it open, um, at least without not you knowing it. I mean, you have to send the device back to them so they're, they're going to inspect it. Actually, not everyone inspects it, and that's another problem. Uh, tamper evidence, um, this is basically temper temperature uh, sensors, uh, any types of um, uh, radiation detection, uh, magnetic switches of sorts. Uh, nichrome wire is a device that is sometimes used to wrap a device before it's potted. And uh, the physical properties of nichrome wire are when you cut the, the wire, it changes the resistance and you can detect a voltage drop. Um, nichrome wire is also um, uh, susceptible to temperature variations. Um, uh, a flex circuit is like a serpentined um, pattern on a, a usually like a, a flimsy plastic coating. And you can sometimes wrap those around I.O. ports specifically. Or uh, I've seen people even wrap them around boards. But uh, um, the milling process of, of flex circuitry is, 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 is not too fine. So you can usually sometimes uh, uh, drill holes in without hitting or breaking the serpentine flex. Um, another thing is they're very difficult to work with in manufacturing when you're bending them and folding them around I.O. ports. A lot of times they break and it's, it, it can be a pain. Um, tamper proofing is not easy and it is costly and that's why I'm trying to uh, stress the use of these more inexpensive um, cryptographic systems on a chip because you don't necessarily need to uh, uh, worry about most of this stuff in those cases. But if you do apply these these techniques on top of using a cryptographic system on a chip, um, it definitely makes the attacker's job a lot harder. Uh, tamper response. This is the uh, end result of any type of detector that you have in the system. Um, generally, the result of uh, tamper being detected is to go out to a device and erase the uh, maybe key contents or any type of logging, audit logging you may have collected. Um, many times, a tamper response uh, circuitry requires a battery so the system can have an active tamper envelope even while the system's powered down, and that is very difficult for uh, en engineers to design, especially when you're using um, ion and radiation detectors. Uh, those are, tend to be relatively costly, and uh, they, they can be very difficult to implement. Um, sometimes you'll want it. You, 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 sometimes you might detect tamper, but it may not warrant a zeroization. You may want to audit the information. It's another result, uh, resultant of. A good example of some of this tamper response, actually, I guess I should say it's a bad example. Um, we, we were investigating a, a time-based hardware token uh, a few years ago. Um, this device did have some tamper responsiveness that was supposed to zeroize certain data if you removed um, the cover. Uh, what we did is we had one device that was basically the sacrificial lamb. Uh, we removed the cover to see where all the components were laid out. Um, and on a good card, we would, a good still working card, we cut away um, only the piece that we needed. Um, and that wasn't detected by this tamper response system. Um, so we could probe the parts that we needed without uh, having um, any of those contents zeroized. So, so it's another, another example of, of you need to implement this stuff correctly in order for it to serve its purpose. So RF, um, emissions, immunity, this is uh, stuff I, I kind of touched upon a little earlier. Um, EMI shielding is important. Uh, this can be in a form of coatings, sprays, um, any kind of housings. Uh, what you want to do is keep, you, you want to reduce um, EMI in your system mainly because of Tempest monitoring, um, which, which is basically recreating um, 
EMI for monitors or keyboards, uh, recreating the signal on an external monitor, external uh, device of some kind. Um, and, and basically, the simple explanation of this is that as voltages are applied to the, the CRT of the monitor, there are spikes and high voltages that, that generate this noise, and um, it creates detectable spikes that could be recreated. Um, there are protection methods available for this. Um, there's soft temp response, which is something that Marcus Kuhn developed um, that will smooth those spikes by using grayscales and colors, which is an interesting approach. Also, you want to be aware of ESD protection. Um, an attacker might possibly uh, try to break or destroy your system or make it do something it wasn't intended to do um, by, by injecting it with, with high voltage signals. Um, protection from this, you could just use TVS devices or diodes, um, which are easily available. External interfaces, um, you want to be aware of devices that have access to the outside world, uh, which would be basically everything. Um, anything using serial ports, phone lines, possibly compact flash. Um, Brian touched on this with his uh, Intel nut structure um, problem, which basically had the serial port that would give back the MAC address of the device, and by using that MAC address, you could determine the uh, administrator password of the box. So. You need to be aware of what data is being sent out of those ports, um, possibly encrypted if you can. That would be good. Um, also be aware if any of your external interfaces provide access to the internal bus. Um, that can give a, a lot of headway for the, for the attacker. Um, an, an example of this is, oh, I, well, Brian, Brian will actually give you an example. Yeah. One example is like token interfaces. A lot of times um, you'll have like an I button or some type of data key like in a stew phone that'll have uh, access to the internal buses and many times you should, you should obviously gate those buses properly with a transceiver. Um, I don't know if too many people know but a lot of times uh, even through transceivers there's a leakage and uh, if you drop a couple um, low ohmage resistors in line with those uh, data lines or even address lines um, you can prevent leaking um, uh, it's not really a covert channel, but you, you can prevent bus leakage that way. Um, a, another example of a real-world um, case of this is the uh, handspring PDA, which is a Palm OS device, kind of like the Palm Pilot. They have this springboard module, which is um, this expansion port that you can design little hardware expansions, kind of like cartridges for. Um, that whole springboard module connects directly to the Dragon Ball uh, 68328 processor in the device. Um, because it's a handheld device and it's kind of like a, a consumer device, there might not be any security problems there. But if, you're, if you wanted to use some kind of expansion module in your device, um, you want to at least m be aware of what you're, what you're giving people access to. Um, also, you disable all of your diagnostic functionality, your JTAG, things that would possibly help, you, help an attacker um, probe the device, uh, gain data out of. Um, one attack as far as uh, token interfaces, uh, that we, we had looked at was with the USB keys again. Um, we wanted to monitor which commands are being sent to the USB key and how the USB protocol, what data was being sent back and forth. Um, by doing that, we could possibly uh, um, generate incorrectly formed USB packets, see how the device responds. So if we can monitor that traffic stream, which wasn't encrypted or anything because it was using the standard USB protocol, we could analyze that a little deeper. Oh. So, in conclusion, there's a lot of data here, I know, and if you have questions, you can either come up now or we can uh, break out in that other session. Um, but as a designer, uh, you want to think as an attacker would. Now, this isn't just keeping up to date with all of the attack methodologies and things which we mentioned at the bottom. This is um, reading this information and seeing how various attacks are, met, are, um, are done. Uh, that way you could possibly think, okay, well, if somebody is accessing the serial double EEPROM in this USB token, maybe I should protect these devices in my product because someone might attack it. So y you can prevent these attacks before they happen, uh, which is a strategic approach and it's something that by designing security into your product from the beginning will hopefully help. Um, you want to allocate time to, to break your product. This, this goes along with the design reviews. Um, try to catch problems as they happen instead of looking at them all at the end and uh, having to go back and redesign. Um, so peer review, third party analysis. Um, so 
the next two slides are references and additional reading. I, hopefully they'll show up in your notes. Um, if not, we'll, we'll have a, uh, we'll put this up on our website, um, probably at, at, uh, at stake.com, maybe uh, in a week or two. Um, so if any folks have questions, feel free to ask. I don't know if we have a microphone anywhere, or you can just yell really loud, and I'll repeat the question. No? Oh, there's, all right, there's a few. Um, actually, would you mind coming up here and using the mic? <laughs> Sorry, that, that was a long question. It had to do with differential power analysis, so here it comes. Thank you. Basically, what I was asking was uh, if you knew of a good circuit design to prevent differential power analysis. I haven't come up with a way. I've, I've been thinking about that in circuits that I've designed, and I haven't come up with a way to to equalize power consumption short of putting something that consumes a whole lot of power right. in line with the circuit, which is not desirable in small devices. Do you all know of a protection against that? Offhand, I don't. I know there have been um, some papers written about that, uh, but I don't know if it's from a circuitry point of view. It might be from, from thwarting those attacks in some software right. way. But yeah, that's definitely that, that's a topic that needs to be addressed and hopefully all right. Between some of us, we'll be able to come up with something. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any other, any other questions? No? OK. Well, thanks a lot. Hopefully, you guys learned something. And uh, bye. <laughs>